In May 1854, slave catchers arrested a 20-year-old man named Anthony Burns in Boston. Burns was the third freedom seeker arrested in the city under the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. That law, a part of the Compromise of 1850, allowed federal marshals to act as slave catchers, enter any northern state or territory, and capture suspected runaways. And should any marshal or deputy marshal refuse to receive such warrant or other process, when tendered, he shall, on conviction thereof, be fined in the sum of $1,000. Anyone caught operating a safe house on the Underground Railroad faced six months imprisonment and a $1,000 fine, a sum roughly equivalent to $33,000 today. And if that wasn't bad enough, you could be deputized on the spot, meaning that average citizens minding their own business could be forced to assist federal marshals. And all good citizens are hereby commanded to aid and assist in the prompt and efficient execution of this law, whenever their services may be required. Widely condemned throughout the North, the Fugitive Slave Law met with extremely forceful opposition from Boston's small but militant black community. Broadsides appeared throughout the city, warning its citizens. Caution, colored people of Boston, one and all. You are hereby respectfully cautioned and advised to avoid conversing with the watchmen and police officers of Boston. For since the recent order of the mayor and aldermen, they are empowered to act as kidnappers and slave catchers. In February 1851, slave catchers arrested Shadrach Minkins, the first to be captured under the fugitive slave law in Boston. Black Bostonians immediately responded to the arrest with force. Yo! They broke into the courthouse where Shadrach was imprisoned, overpowered the guards, and helped him escape north to Canada. Two months later, in April 1851, slave catchers arrested Thomas Sims and returned him to slavery. Battle lines had been drawn between the federal government and Boston's free black community. Three years later, the arrest of Anthony Burns fixed the eyes of the nation upon Boston. On May 26, 1854, 5,000 Bostonians filled Faneuil Hall to protest the arrest of Anthony Burns. It was the largest gathering I ever saw in the hall. The platform was covered with men, the galleries, the floor, even the outer stairways were absolutely filled with a solid audience. Some came to sympathize, more to look on. Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Boston's militant abolitionists, conspicuously absent from the meeting, gathered separately a few blocks away at Tremont Temple. Rather than vote on resolutions condemning the arrest or debate what should be done, the group at Tremont Temple believed direct action to be the only solution. Like the Shadrach rescue three years earlier, they planned to seize Burns in a daring courthouse rescue, anticipating the involvement of the protesters at Faneuil Hall. However, when word arrived that abolitionists were attacking the courthouse, 
That meeting quickly dissolved into chaos. To the courthouse! Miscommunication and confusion ran rampant. While some leaders called for restraint, others advocated joining the attack. Not all who attended the meeting joined in the assault. Some were only willing to witness but not take part. Others simply went home. A small group attempted to break into the courthouse using a large piece of wood from a nearby construction site as a battering ram. Several pistol shots were heard in the entry by those outside, one of which had resulted in the death of one of the hired Assassins of Liberty in the employ of the kidnappers, James Batchelder. The Liberator, June 2nd, 1854. Despite the efforts of Boston's militant abolitionists, Anthony Burns remained in custody. In the aftermath of the attack on the courthouse, Federal Marshal Watson Freeman sent a telegram to President Franklin Pierce explaining the recent events in Boston and that he mobilized two military companies to assist in the protection of the courthouse to prevent further attempts at rescue. Pierce responded, Your conduct is approved. The law must be executed. One eyewitness recalled that, as the trial for Burns began, the hundreds of federal troops guarding the courthouse transformed it into a fortress for the slave power. In court, anti-slavery lawyers Richard Henry Dana and Robert Morris argued for Burns' freedom. Sir, I implore you, in the view of the cruel character of this law, in view of the dreadful consequences of a mistake, send him not away with that tormenting doubt on your mind. The eyes of many millions are upon you, sir. You are to do an act which will hold its place in the history of America, in the history of the progress of the human race. May your judgment be for liberty and not for slavery. Richard Henry Dana. But on June 2nd, 1854, Judge Edward G. Loring ruled in favor of Charles Suttle, Burns' enslaver, and ordered Anthony Burns back to slavery in Virginia. After Loring's decision, the mayor of Boston proclaimed, All citizens are urgently requested to leave those streets which it may be found necessary to clear, and under no circumstance to obstruct or molest any officer, civil or military, in the lawful discharge of his duty. In defiance of the mayor's order, a large crowd of protesters gathered outside of the courthouse and along State Street. An estimated 50,000 strong, the protesters lined Burns' rendition route, witnesses to the solemn procession. Businesses closed, black drapes hung in windows, and American flags hung upside down in protest.
As the federal troops began to march Burns towards Long War, protesters hung a coffin with the word liberty inscribed on it above the street. Echoing the sentiments of many who witnessed the event in disbelief, Martha Russell, a journalist for the National Era, wrote, Did you ever feel every drop of blood in you boiling and seething, throbbing and burning, until it seemed you should suffocate? Did you ever set your teeth hard together to keep down the spirit that was urging you to do something to cool your indignation, that good and wise people would call violence treason? I have felt all this today. I have seen that poor slave, Anthony Burns, carried back into slavery. As the troops slowly marched Burns down State Street, the hostile crowd hissed and shouted shame at them. They marched directly over the site of the Boston Massacre, where 74 years earlier, Crispus Attucks, likely a self-emancipated individual of native and African descent, had been killed by British soldiers. Attucks was considered by many the first martyr of the American Revolution. The sad irony of this scene was not lost on Boston's abolitionists. As the Reverend Eden B. Foster wrote, Never before, since British hirelings stood in the streets of Boston and shot down unarmed and unoffending citizens, has that city been under martial law and military siege. Despite the overwhelming number of protesters, the sheer might of the military discouraged any real attempt to free Burns and left witnesses feeling helpless. Abolitionists shuddered at the nightmarish realization that the federal government and its collaborators in Boston would so willingly and forcibly appease the southern slaveholders. Eyewitness Samuel May, Jr., an ardent abolitionist, described the somber procession as he watched from his father's shop on the corner of State Street and Broad Street. First came a body of troop with drawn swords, then a large force of police and marines with drawn swords, surrounding a hollow square of the same, in the midst of which he walked with a face calm and manly though very serious. Then came a force of infantry. Next came a large brass field piece with artillerymen, loaded to the muzzle and ready to be discharged if needed. Boston and Massachusetts lie, bound hand and foot, willing slaves at the foot of the slave power. After a tense march, Anthony Burns arrived at T Wharf to board the ship that would return him to slavery. If they had only struck when the iron was hot and used very slight precautions, I think the poor slave might have been rescued without shedding blood. But it was not done and order reigns. My soul is just now in a stormy state, and it curses law and order, seeing them arrayed on the wrong side. This fierce mood will soon give place to a milder one. But oh my friend, these continually hobbled efforts for human freedom, they are agonizing to the sympathizing soul. Lydia Mariah Child. In the aftermath of the Burns case, a sense of despair fell on the city of Boston. Despite Child's fears of a fierce mood subsiding, the rendition of Anthony Burns proved to be a flashpoint that ignited change in Massachusetts. 
Amos Lawrence, a wealthy textile magnate, wrote, We went to bed one night, old-fashioned, conservative, compromised union Whigs, and waked up stark, mad abolitionists. Following the rendition, anti-slavery activists led a statewide petition submitted to the Massachusetts legislature calling for a stricter personal liberty law. This law soon passed and essentially nullified the fugitive slave law within the state of Massachusetts. While entrenched in the fight for legislative change, the fate of Anthony Burns never faded from the minds of Bostonians. Less than one year later, Leonard Grimes, a minister at Boston's 12th Baptist Church, raised over $1,200 from the community and purchased Burns' freedom. Burns left the South, moved to Ohio, where he enrolled as a student at Oberlin College. Burns studied theology, became a minister at Zion Baptist Church in St. Catharines, Ontario. Just a few years later, Anthony Burns died of natural causes, a free man.